No, this is an oral history interview with Colonel Walker Melville Bud Mahuron, star of stage and screen, and also a few years in the U.S. Air Force, and, and a Purdue graduate. And the two of us are here today to put together an oral history in which he will tell us and the library, the Purdue Library, about some of his experiences coming to Purdue and then later on uh, going into the Air Force and then what he's done uh, working back with Purdue and some of the honors that he's had. And um, so we're just going to kind of ramble from now on. And, <laughs> and, and I will ask a couple of leading questions. But but he but he won't answer them. He'll just he'll just kind of mumble something else and go about talking what he really likes anyway. So you won't hear from me very much, and that's good because you really want to hear from Bud. And Bud and I've been friends for what 30 years. Easy, yeah, easy 30 years. So let's get started. And I'm going to say, Bud, where were you born? I think I was born. <laughs> In Benton Harbor, Michigan. <laughs> and uh, by the way, I'm adopted. Uh, I was adopted by parents who lived in Fort Wayne, Indiana. My blood parents, I eventually tracked them down and found both of them. And I didn't tell my father who I was. I did tell my mother. And uh, of course, she knew obviously who I was. And uh, I met her. And, spent a couple of years together. They've all died, all that history's gone. Yeah. Mm. That's one of the things that happens when you live a long time. Yeah. Well, you, you find out the longer you live, the less number of good friends you have because they've all died. And, uh, and that's where I am now. Every time I turn around, I get a call late at night. Say, I just heard that Joe Blow just died. I thought you'd like to know. I don't care. I hardly ever knew him. And uh, anyway, he died, croaked. And so the older I get, the more croakers there are. <laughs> and uh, so I look back in my life and try to think of things that would be interesting to somebody else. And that's kind of hard to think of. Yeah. Uh, I've noticed over the years that that uh, I'll get back to this in a minute. That uh, when you get honored for being somebody in the military, forget that that doesn't last very long. Because the military goes through doldrums just like everybody else does, and, and nobody ever heard of them before. And uh, I went back to a. As, as a national invitee to be the Grand Master of a Memorial Day Parade right, in yeah. Washington, D.C., yeah. and uh, Joan was insistent that we go back for that, and uh, I kept thinking about the thing you, Dick, had cooked up. Uh, <laughs> Memorial Veterans Day Parade, wasn't it? I don't know. It was something small. <laughs> <laughs> For testing. And it, anyway, it test and, yeah. we went to it, and uh, we showed up, and uh, I think maybe there were two or three hundred people there. And when I got to Washington for that big thing that Joan insisted I go to, there were two or three people there, too. <laughs> so the history falls off fast. So does the uh, attendee. And uh, what what bothers me about a lot of that stuff is that they told me that in that Memorial Day parade there were going to be a bunch of of returnees from the Gulf or the war in Iraq. Yeah, right. And they were going to be in the parade. There weren't any. Thank you. That I could tell. None from Iraq. I couldn't. I was in the front end and I couldn't see the back end. Yeah. So I didn't know what was in the back end. Anyway, uh, I, by the time I'm through with that thing, uh, 
I was pretty disappointed in it. And, uh, in the parade. Yeah. And uh, there, there were some really important people that should have been in that parade, and I wasn't one of them. Oh, that's not true, bud. Well, yeah, but looking at it from my point of view, that was true. So anyway, uh, when we start talking about a, an oral history, we have to get it around to the point where it's something interesting. Well, yeah, but see, people are going to be interested in you and, and all the things that you've done. Well, and while it may not be that interesting to you, the people that are going to be listening to this are going to be very... See, the problem with that, Dick, is that you wrote that excellent thing about a hero in our myth. Yeah. And, uh, and I bet you two people didn't read that article. Hmm. Uh, we both know it exists. Yeah. Well, well you, your mom... I could get buried with it. I remember your mom... Uh, about the, I, was, I was thinking about you and I talking about you coming to Purdue. And you came to Purdue in, was it, 39? Well, I graduated from high school in 1937. Okay, all right. And uh, I wasn't, uh, in the first place, I didn't have enough money to go to college. And yeah, this, yeah, this is the story. And uh, so I had to wait out. All my, all the people that I ran around with went to college. And I, I was back home in Fort Wayne delivering Chicago Tribunes by bicycle <laughs> to doorsteps. And, uh, and all my friends were sweethearts of Sigma Chi and all that. And uh, Purdue was a big name, and, and uh, I knew where it was, but that was about it. And uh, so when it came time to think about college, Purdue was always in my mind. And so I always thought about going to Purdue. And so I, I ended up by, I worked saving those 25 cents memberships to, to Chicago Tribune for years to get enough money together to pay the, the tuition at Purdue, and it was $75. And I had to save like hell to get that going. And so I finally went to Purdue, sort of with my mother's blessing. Yeah. And uh, I had $75 in my pocket. I had no place to live, no place to eat. Uh, I had a bunch of bor borrowed clothes and uh, a, a suitcase full of clothes that people had given me. Oh my gosh. And so uh, I went down to Purdue and, and uh, I got invited to be uh, invitee, potential invitee at various fraternity houses. Oh yeah. Okay. And various fraternity houses said, you got to join ours. And, and I said, I can't afford you. And I couldn't. And finally, you would know the name of this fraternity. I've forgotten the name of it. I think it was Kappa Sig. Well, it's the best one on Purdue. And anyway, they uh, they said, well, I said, I can't afford a, a fraternity house. And uh, they said, well, that's all right. We got a job for you. This one paid a dollar and a quarter a week. So I was really ruining it. was enough money. To, uh, well, you probably got to eat there too, though. No, no, hell no! I don't. Oh. I'm working, and uh, I I delivered what in those days was called a Fratella card. Yeah, you know, this is the one that we had around the telephone. Yeah, and uh, yeah. my job was to replace those notices in the telephones for a dollar quarter a week. <laughs> and a cab driver would pick me up and drive me around all the places where the phones were located, and and I would replace the Fratella cards. Yeah. And uh, what was the card called again? A, a, they called it a Fratella card. Fratella. Fraternity telephone card. Oh, fraternity. And, okay. So it listed. Fratella. 
the list of the telephone numbers of all the fraternity and sorority houses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. And used to then have the telephone. Uh, it had advertisements for what was in the theaters and that kind and of stuff. And Deeks and that. And yeah. Skids, yeah and but it was very small. Yeah. It was two sheets, one one side and then the other. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I put that around. It, it, uh, it didn't help me join any fraternity, but I got shaving cream and toothbrush the toothpaste and that kind of crap from it. In the meantime, I got a job to kind of Joe Nobody in the, in the men's in the home where this lady was taken in boarders oh, yeah. were Purdue students. Yeah. And so I was one, helped her in the kitchen. Lovely people. <laughs> Do you remember where that where was that? On right, just down the street from where your fraternity was. So it was on North Street or in that area near the Union. If you from your fraternity, if you went kitty corner and down that street, oh, okay. it was on that street. Oh yeah, okay. Down near the village. Um, a block and a half, two yeah. blocks. Yeah. But uh, uh, I didn't live there. I just worked there. And uh, where'd you live? I lived down about a half a block from Deeks on whatever that street was. If you remember the main drag, yeah, yeah, State Street. Then Deeks was on a corner there, right? Yeah. And then down the whatever that street was, yeah. These people had a boarding house, and I could afford to pay the whatever that boarding house cost. Okay. So I lived there with another guy from Fort Wayne. Well, you just had just one room. Yeah. I shared it with him. Yeah. His name was Jack Horn, and uh, then I got my food from that other place. When, when, what year did you get to Purdue? I thought it was 48. No, that was later. What this would have been in the what, thirty eight maybe? Thirty eight. Thirty eight. Yeah. Okay. So you and you started in the school of engineering? Well the, if you remember it was general engineering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I took work. Yeah. I had taken college prep in high school, so I did whatever you could get in. I had to take the entrance exam and I'll never forget that. I you had to drop you in English when your part of the exam came along, you had to write an essay for something or other. And I wrote about taking the streetcar from Purdue over to, to Lafayette. <laughs> that was a whole nickel to ride that streetcar. Oh, yeah, but, but uh, I kind of, I, as I remember, it was kind of, my part of it was kind of funny, so. I didn't talk about throwing up on back of the car, but but anyway, uh, I, I could walk out of that house and get on that streetcar and go down to the city, but that cost a lot of money, and uh, I didn't have any, of course, and uh, so I meagerly made my way through my freshman year and out of my original 17 and two-thirds credit hours I think I passed 10 <laughs> and so I got a you like this because you knew him so my wife or my mother got a note from Elliot saying we don't want him back here anymore and so a note from President Elliot. Yeah, and so uh, uh, Edward C. Elliot. So I couldn't go back to Purdue. So I went to. I spent a year in Fort Wayne going to night school. Yeah. Okay. And uh, 
got credits that way. And then at the end of that, went back to Purdue, and uh, I got accepted again as a freshman at Purdue. And this time, between me and having a job at Cary Hall East in the kitchen, uh, we were able to afford a room in Cary Hall. And I could eat my meals in yeah. waiting in Cary Hall. Yeah, yeah. And so it, I consider that to be an excellent time. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was... Yeah. Uh, well, Cary Hall East at that time was a standalone building. It was there all by itself. Yeah, but they were building. They were building the other building. Yeah. But yeah. East was stood by itself yeah. for a long time. And uh, I can't remember the name of the dietitian who worked in the kitchen. Big, tall, Irish-looking, blonde. Anyway, uh, as the as the dishwasher, I washed the dishes and waited at the table and, and washed dishes at night. And, and my mother could come up with enough money so I could afford to pay for the room. And uh, so at least I had a room and a place to stay. So And I was surrounded by guys in Cary Hall whose families were paying for their going to Purdue. And uh, I'm the poor guy. Yeah. And I'll never forget waiting on table in that dining room at Cary Hall. I go... I had a couple of tables that I was supposed to be responsible for, and every time they served cookies or whatever it was, I had to keep my my thumb on the cookies to keep from spilling off the dishes. And the guys at the table was Ooh, look at him. he's putting dirty fingers on the cookies. Oh, but I can think of a million ex exposures of that one. Uh, you would have been a sophomore then when you went back to the second time. No, I never. I could, didn't, didn't have the grades. So you were still a freshman? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, of course, the money I got working for Perry Hall went back to my mother to help pay for sure. my room. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I don't remember the finances and all that, but they weren't very high. Yeah, I bet not. Well, at the, at the close of that first, or that set, would, would be the second year, did you have better grades? Well, what happened was that I was going to... How did that I was going to, to Purdue and getting some money from the Air Force. I forget how that worked. But anyway, I got a letter from, oh, from the, from the, what's that college thing that the colleges were doing then? I had to go to the dean of men. I forgot how that worked. Anyway, I had a guy back in, in Dayton who was an Air Force officer who was following all of us who were going through, all of us uh, Air Force guys that were going through. This would have been later on, though. It was still, still that in, during that period. Uh, anyway, well, I remember you stopped at some point and went to the primary flight train. Oh, that was when I was in high school. So you had been, when you got to Purdue, you'd been through a primary flight. Yeah. I knew how to fly. Yeah. More or less. <laughs> and, anyway. Where did you go to primary flight? Was that in Grand Tool? No, no, no. That was in Fort Wayne. Okay. But then later on, you went to someplace maybe in Missouri? Oh, the Grand Tool was where... As an Air Force guy on flying status, I had to keep up with my flying, and I drove down to Rantoul for a weekend of flying, because yeah. I had to fly to whatever hours it was per month, and uh, 
that was where we could get on an airplane. This would have been like, it wasn't the Civil Air Patrol, but it would have been, you, you didn't have a rating probably. You were, um, you were in the military, but mm. what, what, did, what, what was your title? I was then, boy, I was then uh, uh, major in the Air Force, I guess. No, no, you wouldn't have been a major then. Uh, yeah, I was. I didn't become a lieutenant colonel until after I'd gone to the Pacific. As okay, but we haven't even gotten to World War II yet, because you were still in Purdue oh. when the war started. Didn't you? Yeah, I was in flying school the day they bombed Pearl Harbor. Okay, that's where we need to be. Okay, and uh, uh, in flying school? Yeah. Yeah, primary flying school. Yeah. And uh, so. Uh, I went to out of primary plan school. I kept going from there to Randolph, from Randolph to Ellington. I finally got a commission. We got to get my book out and read it. Okay, yeah, but but when you finished at Randolph, you went up to to New York. No. Oh boy, that coffee's off. <laughs> Am I wrong? Is my taster going bad? Can our tasters go bad? Yeah, they can. My taster's going bad. Wish you hadn't told me that. Because it'll get worse now. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I wa when I graduated from from flying school, I was in Ellington. And Ellington is where? Where's that located? Huh? Where's Ellington located? Houston. Houston, okay. And uh, uh, it, at Ellington, that's where they lined us all up and said, five feet ten and above are going to go to bombers, five feet nine and below are going to go to fighters. And I went to fighters, <laughs> to light it. And uh, so then, so the so the division of deciding whether you're a fighter or a bomber fighter. Well, how tall you were. <laughs> and the reason for that was they, they, they needed cockpit, sure. They needed bombers, bomber pilots, and they figured you had to be a big guy to fly a bomber. And I was a little guy. And uh, anyway. Ellington was bombardment training, and I remember flying around all over the place, the big streams of these little trainers following each other around, pretending we were bombers. Yeah. Oh, and didn't have any idea what that was. What were you flying, Stearman? AT-6. Oh, the AT-6. Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, on graduation from that, I graduated from that and ended up by being assigned to Teaneck, New Jersey. That's what you were second when you graduated. You were got your second lieutenant. Yeah, and uh, and I had been by that time as a fighter pilot, been transferred to what was called the 56th Observation Corps or some goddamn thing like that. Yeah, and we were transferred up to Fort Dix. And we okay. yeah. on a bus from flying school up to Fort Dixon. The bus is going up to Fort Dixon. There's a little L5 surfing around. I thought, shit, I got to flying school. I got to flying L5s. And we went to Phoenix. There wasn't a base. There wasn't anything. So they said, Mr. Sainu, now you're going to get transferred to Mitchell Field with the 56 fighter group. And that's where I started the fighter pilot business. This was prior to World War II. No, 
World War II is going on. Okay, when did, where were you when, it, when the war started? Primary plans, too. Okay. So anyway, uh, went to the 56 group, but in those days, nobody knew what the hell's going on. So when we went to Mitchell Field, uh, Doolittle was cooking up, getting customers for his Doolittle raid in Tokyo. Yeah. And uh, I kept thinking, geez, there's, there's General Doolittle, who was a Brigadier General. And uh, my guys were all sitting around the wall because the people had graduated a month before wouldn't talk to us because we were newcomers. Oh, I got lots of keen memories of all that. Yeah, I guess. Well, when did you get introduced to the P-47? Well, it was at Mitchell Field. At Mitchell Field. Yeah, okay. Wait a minute, another slur. So, uh, at Mitchell Field, with the 56 fighter group, they had P-38s. And I was getting ready to check out in the P-38. Right. And I had finished my cockpit checks and all that until the day I was going to fly, they transferred the airplanes. So now what are we going to do? They ended up by sending up to Windsor Locks, Connecticut to check out in P-40s. And so, oh my gosh. So from P-38 to a P-40. Yeah, but I didn't get to fly the P-38. Okay, all right. So anyway. We went to Windsor Locks to check out in P-40s, and uh, a lot of the new sports did. So I'm up at Windsor Locks trying to check out in P-40s, and I thought, this is a dog thing, because it wasn't a very good airplane. And uh, I ended up, we were working out of a tent on the field at Mitchell, our squadron was, and uh, when I got back from P-40s, I sat in the tent talking to other pilots, and I was talking about how fast the airplanes would go, and uh, turned out I was the only one that had ever flown a P-47 full throttle, and everybody said, how fast would it go? I said, well, geez, all I saw was about 320 miles an hour, and it had been advertised as 450, yeah. 2,000 horsepower and all that. And the rest of the guys, none of them had flown it fast. In those days, we were told not to fly the airplane at full throttle, wear the engine out. And so we didn't do that. And so we're back at Mitchell Field, going to check out that P-47. I want to quit here. My stomach's getting excited. Go ahead. This is a good spot to, to, to uh, bring it to. Uh -huh. Okay, we're running, bud. Okay. This is our second session. Um, and we left the first session about a week and a half ago when Bud was learning how to, or is being assigned to P-40s at Fort Dix. And... Um, and I, I want him to take off from there. Oh, okay. Well, I was going to start when we were going to help the Great Park. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm worried about that Great Park thing. If that's going to just be a pace where people lie around and enjoy the Oh, you're in Orange County. Yeah, it'd be a flop. California, yeah. And it seems to me like the thing they ought to be thinking about is doing a... There are a lot of guys like me, I know, and you too, who would be delighted to find something to do with ourselves when we were sitting around staring at the walls. <laughs> and that says, there are a lot of guys that are, I watched a show on TV the other night where there was a guy on, Hewlett Hauser, I think, where a guy that's, that's carving stuff you all right? He carves locomotives and things like that. Oh, out of wood, okay. Right. Yeah. And uh, he had a lot of his stuff on display. 
and uh, he's just looking for something to do. And the work that he does is beautiful, and of course he, he's he got it up for sale. Uh, you know what a big boy locomotive looks like. He's got a carving of those things. It's about six feet long, and he does a beautiful job. But there are a lot of guys around who would be just delighted to have a hobby they could go to and either paint or get greasy or hmm. clean up floor and all that. Where are there ever? And uh, if we said it so, and the great part, there were several areas where guys could go and work on stuff. Right. Like, for example, if we had the fire department, they could come and help restore the fire engines or do that. If they, uh, if we decided we were going to try and get that officers club going, they could come and help with that. Uh, all kinds of things. Oh yeah. And and make their lives worthwhile rather than just going to a park and sitting on the grass and staring at the water. Uh, I don't think the Great Park people are even thinking about that kind no, of No, I don't think they are either. And, uh, for example, if you notice in the paper the other night, there was a Lockheed Vent Ventura. Yeah, the PB-1. Was. Yeah, and it was coming in, but it's going to have to be painted, and they got to restore it again. Yeah. Got to put it back together again and all that. Yeah, it was in Katrina, I think, isn't that? What yeah. the storm? And it's going to cost almost a hundred thousand bucks yeah. after it gets here. Well, if we had a bunch of volunteers, guys, that could cut go, that in half. We'd, all we do is paint for the material, and uh, that they're going to have a museum, Air Force or a military museum. Yeah. And it's going to be like that pile of junk they had out there before, where there were airplanes, but nobody ever stopped and looked at them. <laughs> and, uh, it, was an, it was a hangar full of airplanes, but was empty of people. Well, that one wouldn't even... Okay, here we go again. We're going to... We're, we're back. Um, and this is circa 19... 41, and Bud has just uh, been assigned, he was assigned to P-38s, P-38s have moved on, and he's been moved to Fort Dix and assigned to P-40s. So this is in the year, this is 1941, right? Yes. Okay. So anyway, they'll, they, uh, by the time I got to Fort Dix, they had been, uh, all airplanes had been transferred to some other location, and uh, so they were going to send us to Windsor Locks, Connecticut, Connecticut, to check out in P-40s at Windsor Locks in preparation to get something else. And uh, so with that, we all, of course, got shipped by bus to Windsor Locks, Connecticut, and uh, arrived at a place that nobody else has ever been to, <laughs> and uh, yet they had P-40s, and they had a uh, kind of a school set up where you could check out in a P-40, so yeah. all of us had the glor glorious opportunity to check out in P-40s, <laughs> and I hated that. <laughs> I remember you're talking about the P-40 and what a dog it was to fly. Well, not only that, but it had a trigger on the stick. So when you lifted the landing gear handle, the landing gear would start up, but there was a trigger that put hydraulic fluid into it. You had to hold that trigger till the gear came up. So most guys like me would were used to just using the handle to lift the gear up and we do that and forget to press the trigger and we'd fire on for an hour or so with one gear down and the rest halfway up and that was just a disaster and uh, 
I can't remember, but it seems to me like I got about eight or ten hours in P-40s at Windsor Locks and thought it was the pits. It wasn't, it wasn't a military establishment. Yeah. And uh, then after that... Hey, I got to stop you and tell you that the P-40 was a was a P-36 airframe. Oh, I know. And it, it had been built by Curtis Wright. I know. And the guy who had designed that P-36 airframe was a Purdue guy by the name of Don Berlin. I know Don. And Don, and Don Berlin um, was my grand or was, was my father-in-law's roommate, and they were poor as church mice when they went to Purdue. But Don went out, went on to become president of Vertol. I know it. Of a Boeing, a Vertol uh, division of, of Boeing. But anyway, he was the guy that's been given the credit for the design of the P-36 slash P-40. Well, the P-36 was okay. Everybody that was a radio engine. But the P-40 was a dumb. <laughs> the first place it had an Allison engine in it, so it was underpowered. And uh, it, it had a stabilizer, vertical stabilizer, that was offset for the torque. Right, yeah. And it, it never, there was never any way to change that vertical stabilizer. So as you went higher and higher in speed, you used more and more rudder pressure to try, to try to keep it going straight. And it was a dog to fly. And above all, I've been hearing all this story about 400 miles here and 300 miles there. And the Royal Air Force was flying all these high-powered airplanes. and we were flying something in the sky that would barely take off. <laughs> and it was a big disappointment. Anyway, my gang, the gang I was with, got transferred back to Mitchell Field to again fly the P-40. And uh, we flew back to, to Mitchell Field, and there they were on the ramp in all their glory. And uh, so we got ready to check out at Mitchell Field and when it came my turn to fly the P-40 uh, I was in line with several other guys and the first guy that took off increased the coal to or the throttle to his P-40 and ground loop and went skidding off the runway and the next guy that took off he increased the power and w went off to the right and hit a mechanic stand yeah, and of course yeah. blew his propeller and and then it became my turn so uh, I flew uh, that with my feet shaking on the rudder pedals <laughs> I flew off and I flew around for probably 45 minutes with one wheel down one <laughs> wheel up because I didn't know any better and uh in in that episode, I decided I'd try to do a, a slow roll. Yeah, yeah. And so I'd try the slow roll and dish out in the bottom of it. And the P-40 was famous for that. And uh, each time I dished <laughs> worse and worse on, on, on the pullout. So I kept shoving the stick forward, yeah. hoping that would stop the dish. It didn't do that. It put me into an inverted stall, and I had never even thought about an inverted stall, but uh, I went spinning inverted, and, and the only thing I could think of, could think of, was to let go of it, see what happened, because I'm heading for Long Island. Oh, my God. And uh, I got lower and lower, and finally the damn thing straightened out. I don't think you were even trained in inverted. Oh, I, nobody knew anything about it. Yeah. Anyway, the thing pulled out, and I came back and landed, and we had a tent set up on the flight line where our engineering officer would gather pilots to, to brief them. And so I went back to that tent 
where our fellow, my fellow planets were sitting around, and I started asking around, uh, have you guys ever slow roll this thing? None of them had. Hmm. Have you ever opened it up wide? None of them had. And uh, so I couldn't get any fellow airmen kind of information. And uh, uh, so I, I realized that I'm exceeding the memo. Man, you're exceeding the manual. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> uh, I got finally checked out in the P-40, and about that time we got P-47s. And uh, what field did you pick the P-47s up? They were at the Republic of Plant Farmingdale. Okay. Yeah. And uh, we were the first ones to get them. And the first episode was that they sent the uh, then the group commander, whose whose name was Davis Graves, sent him up to pick a B-47 up, and he's coming back over Long Island Sound, and it quit on him. And when it quit. He bailed out and he came back home. And uh, oh, dear. We, uh, uh, when you're a newcomer in the flying business, anytime somebody bails out, you're very concerned because it, it could happen to you. And uh, so everybody wondered why he bailed out. It turned out that the company hadn't pressurized the electrical system in the B-47. Huh. And as a result, the higher uh, I've forgotten what what you call that. The higher electrical force going to the magnetos shorted out the wires from the spark plugs to the magnetos, mm -hmm. and as a result, the magnetos then they just quit quit fire. Yeah, and so it just dropped dead. He bailed out. And, Whoa. Uh, well, that could have happened to every airplane. Then. Well, it did happen to everyone that was, as soon as they corrected it. And then that was another episode that took a long time. My initial experience in the flying business wasn't too glamorous. <laughs> anyway, it's not. We finally got P-47s that would operate. And uh, we finally got to the point where I, I started flying them upside down, up and down Long Island Sound. Yeah. And uh, I was doing that one day, and uh, and I noticed the temperature on the engine kept going up and up and up as I'm uh, upside down. And uh, I thought I better get the hell home and land. And at that time. Our field was uh, just outside of Stanford, Connecticut, and uh, I landed, and as I'm trying to taxi back, the engine quit, the prop flow froze on me, oh. and uh, come to find out that they didn't have it set so the oil pump would pump oil when it was upside down. Oh my gosh, oh my god, in a fighter yet. Yeah, well, who knew? Who knew some asshole <laughs> was going to come along and fly it upside down? <laughs> so that was another grounding of the P-47 while I repaired that one. And uh, while we're doing that, I'm we're getting instructions from our group commander, uh, that we're going to get shipped to England, and he's got us marching up and down the field at Stamford, Connecticut, in the dead of winter with snow all over everywhere, marching, officers, <laughs> waking up at the crack of dawn, no airplanes, but a lot of marching. <laughs> and uh, so This wasn't a hub, was it? It was hub. It was oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh oh. Uh, Just for the record, Hub, Hub Zemke was the CEO of the 56 Fighter Squadron. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, Hub's idea was got to keep him busy. <laughs> I'll have to think more about this and 
remember a lot of it, so shut it off now. We'll <laughs> take it again. <laughs> Okay, we're going to continue here. Um, we're at March the uh, 6th, and we're sitting in the alley, and we're going to continue our recording here. Bud has just arrived in England and been assigned to the 56th Fighter Squadron. And Bud, tell us a bit about uh, how England struck in what you thought of the all the events going on there at the time? Well, the main thing about England was that I've never been overseas before. I had no idea what a foreign country looked like, and uh, I remember as as we're heading toward England, uh, I couldn't understand why the hills weren't all pink because that's the way they were in the geography books. <laughs> and uh, anyway, we uh, we came in on uh, Queen Elizabeth and it, uh, we first went to a, it was called the Hull, Hull on the Humber River. Oh, that's where the Queen Docked, yeah. and uh, they they pulled us alongside the ship, pulled the, the the boats, and we got off and went ashore. And there were trains waiting for us to get on a train and go to our form, final base, which was Wittering. Wittering. W i t t e r i n g, and Wittering had been. Uh, I guess a flying school for the Royal Air Force, and it was a, it had a runway about three and a half miles long, and uh, uh, took up all the flat land in England. No, not really, and and uh, it had been used as sort of a recovery base for crashed aircraft, and uh, they had quarters. They took us right away to the officers' club. And uh, all the, what, because they'd been in the war for a long time, the, the facilities they had for officers and messing and all that were just great. You know, the old style, class A, napkins and all that. And so that was impressive to us. We were eating on the grub style. Particularly after the Queen Elizabeth. Well, except you have to remember that on the Queen Elizabeth, I was in a stateroom with 12 other guys, and the stateroom was built for two people. <laughs> and we ate in shifts. Uh, one shift will go to the dining room, and then as soon as they were through eating, then the other shift would come in. So uh, we were exposed mostly to the to the waiting staff on the Queen Elizabeth, and uh, they were all concerned. I didn't realize it at the time, but we were supposed to tip them. And, <laughs> and tipping in England was a lot different than, than it is in America. But anyway, uh, the train took us down to it's Peterborough was the name of the village near Wittering, and uh, we were disembarked from the train and driven in the truck over to RAF Wittering and uh, into the our quarters and they were pretty nice and of course the British all had Batman for their officer corps so so there were Batman hovering all around and I didn't know how to treat them and it's foreign to me and uh, so our exposure to that was pretty impressive. And uh, there weren't any, as, as I could tell, there weren't any flying machines out and around. Uh, they, they did things differently than we did. For example, I was in a flight, and, and there were three or four flights to a squadron. And uh, so my flight had a terror their own quarters, so to speak, for the operations room. Right. 
we were in a little sort of a, a it's sort of a hunter's cabin on the edge of the field, and we had a phone and all that. But uh, we could park our airplanes out in front, yeah. and the idea is if we had an alert, we could rush out and get in the airplanes and, and take off right away. It was all grass. Yeah, and uh, I didn't realize what the drill was. We didn't have any experience. Hub Zimski was dumb, or not Hub. Uh, they, uh, Phil Tukey was dumber than all about all of it, as we were. And so nobody ever explained it to us what, what was going to go on if we got an alert. Well, what was supposed to go on is the, our phone r would ring in our little shack, and we rush out and get in our airplanes, take off and contact the the ground service, and then they would tell us what to do next. It was nuts. But, but naive was rampant. And, uh, of course, Hub and... And well, what did you, where were your airplanes all this time? They hadn't come in yet. So you're sitting in there waiting for your airplane. Yeah. And of course, uh, in the meantime, the RAF was saying, what are you doing with those bloody great trucks that are coming on there? Talking about our P-47s. Because standing next to a Spitfire, the jug was a big airplane. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so... Twice the size. And so the RAF was sort of saying, you guys just might walk home. And to a newcomer like me, scared to death. I didn't know what that meant. But uh, uh, finally our airplane started to stumble in and we got sort of organized. Were they, they came over in crates, I said. They came on ship and... Uh, had to be assembled. Yeah, except they were wrapped in cocoons and the con they had to go through a depot where the cocoon was taken off and they were assembled. And then the theory was that we would get on and pick them up and bring them up to Wittering. And uh, so that was in the process. And uh, we're the whole thing was half, half nuts because it's a cluster nobody knew anything. And, uh, uh, one of the things that happened to my flight was that we got transferred initially down to to a raft base called Tangmere, I think, down on down on the coast. Yeah. And uh, so it, well, that was where the first radar was. I think. I don't remember, but. I do remember that uh, there was an R and F base there, and and uh, I'm almost sure that's where they we flew our jugs in, and uh, the first thing that greeted us was that well this guy's going to be a helpful raft guy, and uh, his name was Dizzy Allen, D I Z Z Y, nice guy, but he was flying uh, hurricanes. I'll trade you a ride in the hurricane for a ride on a P-47. Of course, we said yes, and, <laughs> and I thought the hurricane was a, a dumb airplane because it wouldn't go anyplace. It was very slow. Well, it was made out of wood and canvas. And canvas, yeah. But uh, it was all they had, and it was quite successful during the Battle of Britain. And uh, so. We, we ostensibly were supposed to be on the alert at Tangmere, and uh, if the uh, German airplanes came out of France, we were supposed to take off and ward them off, and without any preparation at all. And uh, we did that. Uh, right now I can't remember the name of the, the ground controller, but in, in those days, he was very famous because he'd been a ground controller during the Battle of Britain. Oh, yeah. And so all the pilots knew who the hell he was. I could find his name in my book. But at any rate, uh, we never got scrambled. We'd get up and fly up, up and down the coast near the Isle of Wight. 
yeah. and uh, yeah. I had no idea what would happen if whoever ran into the Germans. <laughs> it's just as well because they'd have shot my ass off, I'm sure, and neither the rest of my flight. And uh, so I think we were there for about a month and uh, never saw anything that even thought about being an enemy. And I tried to find Dizzy, Dizzy Allen over the years, never heard his name again. Although he was a, apparently had shot down a bunch of German airplanes. There was a lot of that history that they talked about that we couldn't remember. Anyway. Uh, that experience didn't teach us any, didn't teach me anything. And uh, we got some more time, got more time in the air. Yeah, but, but by that time we had a lot of time in the airplane. And uh, then when we were through with that one, we were transferred back to, to our then base was Wittering. And from Wittering, the whole group was transferred to Horsham St. Faith, which was in Norwich. And uh, Horsham was a permanent RF base. And uh, we were transferred to Horsham. And again, brick quarters and nice places. All I remember is that we were issued bicycles. So we had ways to get we had bicycles. Yeah, we had we had ways to get back and forth to the flying line. But uh, the the problem was that was we were usually dueling with bicycles, and so we had a whole ream of wrecked bicycles standing there. We were wrecked. Uh, Could you ride them into town? Oh no. We would never went to town, and uh, uh, I never did figure out what was going on at Horse and Safe Bay, except that uh, that was where we flew our first, could call it combat missions, and uh, by that time, the Eagle Squadron, the American pilots, who had, an, had fixed it, so we would go down and fly a couple of missions with them just to see what it was like. And they were making short dashes over to the French countryside. Were they flying Spitfires? Yeah. And uh, I remember the first combat mission I flew, I was tail end Charlie out of 16 airplanes and uh, scared to death, of course. We made a mad dash in the land, turned around made a mad dash back out again. Never saw anything. But the first was big around Calais, somewhere in that area. No, it was north there. West End. Someplace like that. Anyway, I in my book, but uh, uh, I flew a couple of combat missions in that time. Scared to death. I, I did, nobody had any idea what the Germans looked like, or what we looked like, or what would we do. We were in ground control, of course, and uh, the, our, our chief, like, hub, he had no idea either. How was the weather? I don't remember that it was a factor. We didn't get scrambled unless it was pretty clear. And, uh, of course, we... The, the amount of time we spent over the old country, which you could call a combat mission, was like 15 minutes, and turned around and came tearing back. And uh, I can't remember much except looking down at the, how the Dutch countryside, and the Dutch countryside consisted of a whole bunch of little squares. Yeah where they had garden plots and all that. And so we, uh, 
didn't learn much. And uh, I remember that uh, then one of the hot guys with the Eagle Squadron was a guy named Don Blakesley. And Blakesley led one of those missions. I can't even remember what it looked like then. <laughs> Chesley Peterson was one of their hot guys. And I don't think I ever met Chess till later on. But uh, that was our in introduction to combat. And uh, as this kept on for a while. On one mission, the guys, we could hear them when they were fighting because they were close by. The one mission they went, I well, wasn't on the mission, but they went over to, to do combat. The Germans jumped them, and they shot down three captains. I can't remember exactly, but they shot down a couple of airplanes. And uh, one, one of the guys brought a wounded airplane home, and he couldn't get one of his gears down, so Hub made him bail out. And uh, that became a big story in the in the London papers. Uh, but, but the guys that got shot down were all our senior flight leaders. And uh, that there, see, we went overseas thinking, you don't dare use a lot of horsepower in the engines because it takes time off the engines. So we'd, we'd fly rat race with each other at cruising throttle. And uh, so I'm sure that some of the guys that got shot down were trying to fight the Germans in cruise. In cruise. And because uh, they were saving the engine. <laughs> anyway, one of the guys that got shot down was my flight leader, a guy named Roger Dyer. I could take him any day in the weekend, my airplane. <laughs> Another guy was were weather you flying, Were you flying the airplane that uh, you, know, you called the spirit of Atlantic City? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because that's the only one I got. Boy, I'd have to look at my book. I think I was. Anyway, uh, take this thing off of me.